afternoon, everybody. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, the digital education partner of your Toronto Zoo. I am so excited to be here with you today as we continue our effort to showcase and celebrate the most amazing people and places around the globe working in adventure, conservation, and science. Now, the Toronto Zoo has joined us for so, so many programs over the last couple of years, and it's been such a special opportunity to feature their wildlife. From polar bears to giraffes, lots of birds and mammals going on. Today, we're going to do a little bit of something different and particularly with some of my very favorite creatures. Now I grew up as a boy in Toronto. The Toronto Zoo is like a home away from home to me and my very favorite pavilion was called the Australasia Pavilion where they specialize in featuring some really amazing reptiles and amphibians. Now for our students today in our classes a lot of you might have a favorite animal. Maybe it's a bear or a lion or a tiger oh my. Maybe it's something like a flamingo or an eagle and those are all perfectly valid choices. When I was a kid, my favorite things were snakes and crocodilians. I loved reptiles. The fact that they're so unique, the fact that they've lived so long on this planet, they're such special creatures. And so today, we're going to explore the wide and wonderful world of reptiles and amphibians, learn a little bit about how they maintain their temperature in something called thermoregulation, which is your science term of the day. And without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Mary Ellen to blow our mind over the next 20 minutes or so. So buckle up, folks, and let's dive in. Thanks, Mary Ellen. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me here today. I'm so excited to have you. Like Jesse said, we are in our Australasia section of the Toronto Zoo right now. But before we get started on our super exciting program, we are going to bring up really quickly and do a land acknowledgement here for the Toronto Zoo. So we acknowledge that the land we stand on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek and the Chippewa of the Haudenosaunee and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to so many diverse First, Na First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. I also acknowledge that, the Tron that Toronto is covered by the Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit and the Williams Treaty signed with multiple Mississaugas and the Chippewa bands. Thanks so much, Jesse. All right, so let's get started on our program here. Like Jesse said, we are going to be learning about quite a few reptiles and amphibians as well today. Um, but I wanted to make sure there were some that we could relate to. Uh, so we are, in fact, humans, So and we are mammals. Uh, so I've also featured a couple mammals here for us as well today. But unfortunately, Puzzle, she's right behind me there in her little uh, nest box. She looks a little bit shy today, so don't worry. I do have some photos we can show of her so you know what she looks like. Uh, now, while we go through our program today, I want to test everybody's knowledge who's watching today. We have done so many of these videos in the past two years, and we have learned so much together. So I want to see how much we've actually retained and we remember. So I'm going to be asking quite a few questions through today's program. So teachers, educators, parents, children, everybody who's watching, make sure you're near your keyboard and type in your answers. Jesse's gonna read some of them back for me uh, when we ask our questions and we'll see and get everyone participating. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn our camera around here. So give me one quick second. Um, and then we're going to talk about puzzle and how different animals like to thermoregulate and what really is thermoregulation. So as some of you might know from in your science classes, we learn about a term called cold-blooded and warm-blooded. I'll just throw those words out there. Jesse, do we have anyone saying, yes, I know those in the chats? Ooh, so again, folks on YouTube, folks on Facebook, we've got a wide audience from all around the world today on the Zoo Facebook channel in particular, which is awesome, plus all our crew live here on StreamYard. Uh, so we've got our class saying, yes, they're familiar, cold-blooded, warm-blooded, what do we got in the chat? Uh, all sorts of yeses, so yes galore, Mary Ellen, which is a good Beautiful. sign. Beautiful, that is a great sign to start. So. I'm going to be using those terms today. So warm blooded and cold blooded as I talk about animals, but I want to introduce you to a really quick term. Um, that's maybe a better way to describe those words. And it might be a new word for you today as well. So instead of warm blooded, a more proper word for it is called endothermic, which means inside temperature. And instead of cold blooded, a more proper term is ecto thermic, which means outside temperature. And this is because warm and cold blood can be kind of confusing. If you have really warm blood or you have really cold blood, you actually may not be alive anymore. 
your blood needs to be the exact right temperature for your body. And most of the time, that's a little bit on the warmer side. But if we get too hot, then we overheat. And if we get too cold, we can get something called hypothermia. So our bodies are designed, and every animal species out there, their body is designed to keep their temperature at the exact right amount for their species. So since Puzzle here doesn't look like she wants to come out, I'll show you a photo of her. Um, so you know what she looks like. This is what our tree kang kangaroos look like. And we'll just keep moving on and go find our next animal friend first um, to use as our example. So I was saying inside and outside temperature. So animals who are warm blooded like humans, we can control our body temperature from within our body. So Jesse, this is where we're gonna get people to answer here. Does anybody know what your body does when you get too hot? How does your body help you to cool down when you get really warm as a human? Mm, I've gone for a run. It's 30 degrees outside Celsius for our American friends. And I'm, just, <laughs> I'm, I'm oh, I almost gave it away. I'm not going to give it away. This is like, this is the problem. Is now I'm excited to do question and answer with you. So we've got, ooh, fever is an answer for some of our classes. Oh, okay, yeah. This Wheaties class said you sweat. So yeah. I think we might have our answer there. We do, exactly. Your body is going to sweat. Now, same question, but the reverse. What does your body do if you get really, really cold as a human being? It's it's negative 30 outside now, which here in Canada, we definitely get both of those days. Um, and you're outside, you're building a snowman, and you come inside because you're so cold. What does your body usually do? None of us want to think about building a snowman <laughs> anymore. Those days are done, Mary Ellen. Yeah. During the end of March. Come on now. So we've got shiver. Shiver. All, all our teachers are yelling out shiver. That's Beautiful. Awesome. Exactly. Yeah. So that is a way that our body does things for us to keep us at the right temperature. I don't know about any of you, but I can't control when my body sweats. When I get hot, I sweat. Same thing with shivering. If I'm cold, I just start to shiver. Your body does that for you to help keep you alive. Now, these are our bearded dragon friends here, and they are the opposite of humans. So we have one right in front of us, and another one is actually using something in his exhibit right now to help him warm up, and we're gonna talk about that in a second. But these guys in front of us are the opposite of humans. They're what's called a cold-blooded or ectothermic species. And what that means is that he can't sweat and he can't shiver. So then we ask ourselves, well, how does he stay at the right body temperature to be alive? And that is he uses his environment. So the spaces around them. Now we're gonna take a quick step back here and look at their overall exhibit. And the way that we help them here at the Toronto Zoo is we like to make it as natural as possible and mimic their habitat in the wild. So in the wild, they would be able to find sunny rocks to sit on or maybe cool shaded dens. And so we've done that right here. This half of the exhibit is the warm half and this half is the cold half. And the reason I know that is because we have a very bright light up in the corner. Now this isn't just any normal light bulb. This is a special one that gives off a lot of heat from it. So if I were to put my hand right underneath of it, it would get quite warm. And that light shines down on these rocks and makes them nice and toasty for our little friends in here. So this one here, he is basking in the light. So he's got his head up tilted. His eyes are actually closed right now. Um, and he looks very content. He's just kind of relaxing, just chilling, hanging out. This one here, he's not under the light, but he's also not over in the cold section. So this tells me that he's just right. This is like a perfect spring day for them here. They don't need a coat to go outside when they're okay and just kind of being outside in a t-shirt. So he doesn't need to go to the hot area or the cold area. He's just perfect. Now sitting under a sun or not sitting under the sun is a great way to warm up or cool down, but animals can take it a step further. So if we look really closely at his back, 
you might be able to see that there's a pattern on his back and he's got a combination of dark spots and light spots. Now, I don't know if we all know this, there's a really fun experiment you can do with ice cubes. So on a really hot summer's day, find a piece of black clothing or cloth and put an ice cube in it outside. And then do the same thing with a piece of white clothing or cloth. And what you're gonna see is that the dark uh, ice cube or the dark clothing melts the ice cube faster. And this is because dark pigmentation or coloring will absorb more sunlight. So having dark spots and patterns all over their body actually helps them to use that sunlight or that heat more effectively or efficiently and warm up faster. So I don't know if you've noticed a trend yet. I know I've only shown two animals so far, but our mammal, so just like humans, was our warm-blooded and our cold-blooded animal was a reptile. We're gonna come over here to our next tank. And this is actually an underwater friend for us. So they're gonna be swimming by. This is a fly nose turtle or fly river turtle, sorry. And I want us to guess, do we think this animal is warm blooded or cold blooded? Uh, I wanna guess that they're adorable to kick us <laughs> off as we're, we got, honestly, we've so lucked out with the animal interactions in these zoo programs. Like I've been at this tank and this does not happen all the time. It's amazing. <laughs> so, oh, we got a little bit of a mix. Most of our teachers think cold. One of our teachers thinks warm. But I think cold is our overwhelming answer, 80%. Cold, yes, we are correct. This is a cold-blooded or ectothermic animal. So even though they spend most of their time in the water, um, they are cold blooded. So they do require uh, the temperature or their environment or home around them to help them with their body temperature. Now, just because animals are so incredibly cool, they can take being warm or cold blooded to an even further step. And I'm not gonna use the scientific words for it because they're quite large. Um, but I'll use kind of the more natural terms for them, and that is little range and big range. So some animals can handle their body being hot and cold, and some animals can only handle their body being one temperature. To give you an example, humans, our body has to stay basically the exact same temperature all the time. Somebody already mentioned earlier in our program, uh, if we get too hot, it's called a fever. So even if we go up one degree Celsius in our body, that is considered a fever and you can get sick from that or it's a, a sign of sickness. There are some animals, like a lot of reptiles, because they rely on their environment to help them with their body temperature, they can't control the weather. So maybe they're gonna have a few cloudy days in a row and they won't have that sun to warm up their water or maybe their basking light or their rock. So that means that their body can have a range of temperatures that they can be at and still be safe and healthy. And animals like reptiles are a perfect example of this and amphibians. So think of frogs, turtles, tortoises, snakes, lizards, those kind of animals. Birds and mammals like humans often need that one specific temperature to be healthy. Now, a little bit of a funny story here for us is I'll show us above area. This tank is actually in our free flight aviary. So you can actually walk right beside them, just like some of our people friends are doing over there. And the way that we help these turtles to keep their temperature is we do warm and cool the water for them. Now, occasionally the power goes out or something might break with our, our cooling and heating system. And one day their tank did break and the keepers came in the next morning and there were no turtles in the tank. They had actually crawled out, which they don't do very often, and were walking on the path in the aviary looking for warmer water to help with their body temperature. So these animals are very smart and very instinctual they know what they need for their body and they will go to great lengths to find it. All right, Jesse's definitely right here. These guys have put on a show for us. So we're gonna keep going and go find our next animals to do a little comparison with. 
So this is our reptile wall here at the zoo. So in this exhibit, oh, this is a perfect comparison here. We actually have a few other turtles. So these are called red-bellied, short-necked turtles. And you can see that they do have water. This is where they'd go if they want to cool off. So here's our one friend down there swimming. But we can also see that there's two of them up on land here. So that tells me that they're looking to get a little bit warmer. Because if we look, we can see their basking light right there. Now, another creature that's also in this exhibit is called a black tree monitor. And they're actually all taking a little nap. Turtle, turtle, black tree monitor right there. Um, I think that could be a new game to replace duck, duck, goose. Uh, they are all taking a nap right next to each other here and warming up with their light. Now, there is another reason that reptiles will go towards a basking light or towards the sun. Does anyone want to try and guess, not just to warm up overall, but why do we think they might also uh, go near their light? Uh huh i don't know that's fascinating by the way turtle turtle black monitor is, is would be an interesting game we can try that with our classes later today <laughs> you want to throw in the chat other than just getting warm is there a reason why you want to hang out near our light oh we've got this gorgeous snake i mean right up to the camera again it's just unbelievable so you're, you're not getting anyone with this one so far oh for safety maybe stay safety near the oh okay yeah, like that that's our only answer so far you you might have stumbled okay on Maybe I'll give some clues here first because I want to see if we can get okay. it. So I want everyone to imagine you've just finished like a really big meal. You've just eaten mm. a lot of food, like a delicious meal, big dinner. Mm. Do you really want to go and run a marathon after that? Or do you think you want to curl up and be cozy? What do we you've think got, our, oh. our thoughts on? So as your clues are coming in, we're getting more opportunity or people coming in with answers. We've got laying eggs, help them lay eggs to metabolize oh. calcium. That's interesting. Oh, very specific. Uh, I like that. Be cozy and then to help digest. Yeah. Oh my there. goodness. Oh. Wow. This was a perfect time. That was a great yawn right there from our snake. That was probably the best uh, snake encounter there I've ever just had in my six years of being at the zoo, everybody. So that was wonderful. I've never actually seen them do that. Um, yes, that was the correct answer to help them digest. And snakes are a great example of this. This also happens to be my favorite snake in the whole zoo. And that is actually because of their name. So they're called the red-tailed green rat snake. And the reason that I love them so much is because their name is so literal for them. Uh, what are they? Well, they're a snake. In fact, they are a red-tailed green snake. Well, Mary Ellen, what do they like to eat? Well, you don't say. They like rats. Therefore, they are named the red-tailed green rat snake. Everything you need to know about these guys is in their name, which is why I love them so much. But I'll go back to our digestion talk here. It just goes to show that there's multiple reasons for temperature differences and thermal regulation. So we are correct here. The group was correct. After they have a big meal, you'll often find a lot of uh, animals trying to be very warm. So their heat lamp is just up here. That's that one up there is basking. And that's because it helps speed up their metabolism and digest their food faster. These animals are eating um, in the wild live prey, uh, but mostly meat is the key component here. And meat can go bad if it takes too long to digest in their system. So they want to digest it as fast as possible to make sure they don't get sick. And they also want to get all of the nutrients possible out of it as well. All right, now our next couple snakes here are like we copy and pasted them next door to each other. We have three big snakes in a row. And you'll get what I mean here as we start to look at them. So this one's here called the Emerald Tree Boa. And then right next door, you're gonna say, Mary Ellen, you're just looking at the same snake, but nope, they are different. This is called a green tree python. And they follow the same sort of habits that I just mentioned. Uh, they'll go near their basking lamp when they wanna be hot. They go into their cooler, lower sections when they wanna be cold. We also keep, you're gonna notice there's a lot on the, on the glass here. It's not super clear. 
that is actually water. So we mist their environment, like with a spray bottle every day, a couple times a day actually. And that's to make sure they have humidity in their habitat with them because they really like that humidity. All right, we're gonna come around the corner here. And I always say this, again, we're veering off of our thermoregulation here, but that's okay for one second because I cannot uh, go in this exhibit without telling a quick little story. So in here, we're gonna see two little wombats, Arthur and Matilda. Here's one of them right now. We'll keep our eyes peeled for the other one. But as I'm looking around, I'm also looking for a creature named Annie. Now, Jesse knows about Annie, and I, I don't actually know, Jesse, have you ever seen Annie in person here at the zoo? I've never seen Annie, and I really want to, but I know you have even more reason to want to. <laughs> right? It has been six and a half years of never seeing Annie, and we know she's here because she does eat. And the best way to describe her, she is called an echidna. So I like to imagine if a platypus and a porcupine had a baby together. The best I can do is show you a photo of her right here. And that is what she looks like. And the reason we can never see her is because if you see all these holes in the exhibit, she likes to dig and she likes to be underground. And she doesn't really come out and about at this time of the day. She's more of a sunset kind of gal. She likes that golden hour. Um, and so she's not gonna be out. She's gonna be sleeping right now. But animals like our wombats, they're going to be out and about right now, and then they sleep more during the night. Now, it's kind of an interesting topic to think about a mammal going underground. But it really makes sense. We know of a lot of snake species and animals during the winter will go underground in cold climates like here in Canada. And they do this to escape the really cold weather. And that's because as you go underground, the temperature becomes more consistent or constant. So they don't have to worry about negative 30 weather or positive 30 weather. It's gonna stay more neutral for them. So that's why it's a safer place for them to be um, is underground. Now, my last really cool thing here, and then we're gonna go see our big, uh, big boy animal over in the corner, one of our last animals we're gonna talk about today is the wombat is super special for a couple reasons. One, they are a mammal who has a pouch. So think of a kangaroo, like our tree kangaroo we met earlier puzzle. They have a little pouch to keep their babies in, which is really cool. And that's how they help keep them safe. But the other really cool thing is they are a mammal, which means, what are they? Are they warm or cold blooded? Let's all do a little check, quick reminder here. They're a mammal. Mm. Our mammal. While we're waiting for the answer to come in, I will note that a group of wombats is called a wisdom, and it's one of the great names of the entire <laughs> animal kingdom. So thank you for that, world. Uh, warm blooded. Uh, you, you got it. You, you've inspired them all, Mary Ellen. They know. I love it. Know. There we go. We, we are warm blooded. So they are a warm blooded animal, but their babies are not. So when animals who are marsupials, so they have a pouch. Oh, he's actually going outside now for us. When they are first born, they're actually born as a cold-blooded animal. And then after they go into their mother's pouch and emerge a few months later, that's when they're a warm-blooded animal. So it's really cool. They actually change between being warm-blooded and cold-blooded throughout their lives, which I think is just an incredible adaptation for them. It's just so cool. All right, now our last animal we're gonna be talking about kind of in depth today is Keelat. He is our Komodo dragon here at the Toronto Zoo. And his exhibit is again, a really great example of how we try and mimic a natural habitat. So we can see here, he's got water to cool off in if he needs it. They can swim also. So they are pretty decent swimmers actually. And then up, it's a little bit hidden, but one, two, three, four in a row there, he's got his heat lamps. And that's why he's sitting right there, because he's either trying to warm up or, as we learned, he might be digesting a meal. So he's chilling underneath of his heat lamps right now. Alrighty, I think that brings us to the end of our main portion here today of our video. So we're going to hand it over. So if you have any questions about the animals we learned here today um, or any other questions about the zoo, it's time to ask them. I love answering questions. 
All right. Well, Mary Ellen, thank you so much. And what a diverse group of creatures. I've already taken the snapshot of our snake yawning on camera. That is unbelievable. I've only seen that a few times in my whole life, and I had a pet snake. So there you go. <laughs> uh, we've got groups joining us from around the world today. Our first uh, person joining us on Facebook talking about the fact they're in Germany today. So an international audience for our Zoom wow. program, welcoming everybody. So please feel free to share those questions in the chat. We are going to go to our live class to kick us off today. So I want to start with Ms. Charuri's class. They're joining us in Oshawa, Ontario today. Uh, Ms. Charuri, if you want to unmute your microphone, come on up. All our teachers can keep their mics unmuted as we dive in with Q&A. But let's head to uh, the class there. Hi, guys. Keep that mic unmuted and you're good to go to kick us off. Hmm. Oh, just right on the bottom of your screen. You don't need to type in the chat. Come on live. Better that way. I'll come back to you guys in two quick seconds. Teachers, keep your mics unmuted, okay? It'll mean we can go for the Q&A way faster together. Let's go to Good Shepherd, Miss Benoit's class. Come on in and take us away. Hey! <laughs> um, why did the turtle that you showed us a spiny soft shell? Oh, could you repeat that one really quick? Was the turtle that you showed us a spiny soft shell? Yeah. Oh, good question. So the two turtles that we saw, um, we saw a red-bellied turtle, and then we met a um, a fly river turtle as well. Um, while they are uh, kind of a soft shell turtle, uh, they weren't the spiny soft soft shell. Okay. Perfect first question. All right. I'm Mary Ellen. Your mic's muted now. This is half the fun of video broadcast. Everyone's mics have to be muted at some point during the session. Uh, let's go to our second street junior middle school, Mr. Falconer's class. Welcome in, guys, in Toronto. If you guys have a question for us, come on up. Hey. Hi there. Oh, if you're sharing it, your mics are off. So we got to come in a little early, guys. Your mic's on, but it's just not working for us right now. So share your question in the chat. I'm really sorry, guys. <laughs> Everyone's got some technical difficulties today. Keeps us on our toes. Uh, Ms. Borg's class, joining us in Connecticut, if you guys have a question, I'll come to you in a second. Come on in, grade twos, hi. <laughs> nope, your mic's not working either. Nobody's mics are working. You're all attached, but nothing's... Oh, working. no. This is half our fun, Mary Ellen. This is the most ever it is. mics that have been not working. Uh, let's take some from YouTube for a minute. We'll go to Mr. Chaddock's class in a minute. Oh, so Miss Abby's class on YouTube wants to know, is there such a thing as an ectothermic cold-blooded creature or an endothermic warm-blooded creature? So do you get sort of like a mix yeah. of them at any point or not? You definitely can. So um, I'll use the warm and cold-blooded kind of words right now, but essentially the warm-blooded is an endothermic animal. It's just a more accurate way of saying warm-blooded. And ectothermic is cold-blooded, but where you can get the mix is you can get a warm-blooded species that needs to have a very specific temperature to survive or a warm-blooded species that can have a wide range of temperature. So for example, human beings, we are warm-blooded endothermic and we can only survive if our body temperature is one specific, I believe it's around 37 degrees Celsius, if we even go up to 38 or 39 degrees Celsius, that can really hurt us. And that's called a fever. And we, we're usually sick when that happens. And having a fever for too long can actually be really bad for our health. But I don't know if anyone, I might be dating myself here. Uh, there is a TV show called Kim Possible and they have a pet naked mole rat on that show. We do have naked mole rats here at the Toronto Zoo, uh, but they live in the African Rainforest Pavilion. So they're not near us right now but they are a mammal that is cold blooded um, and can survive at a wide range underground. So they're kind of a very unique species. Um, they're kind of an outlier. And then our marsupials, so our wombats that we just met, they are cold blooded or ectothermic at birth, but turn endothermic or warm blooded later on in life. So you definitely can get a combination that's what makes animals and science and species out there so cool is you have this diverse range and it's very much needed for all of them to be able to survive in their designated habitat or home. So it's an incredible range we can see out there. Very, very cool and great question, guys. All right, let's head to Chalk River, Ontario for Mr. Shadow's group. Unmute that mic, fingers crossed, and we're gonna come back to our live classes and see if everything's working in just a second. So just bottom of your screen, that microphone symbol. Uh, there you go. How long till the meat goes bad in the snake's stomach? 
Ooh, how long until the meat goes bad? That's a great question. Depends on what they were eating and how long it was maybe already passed away for. So animals like Kiko here, um, he also takes a long time to digest, but he also takes a long time to actually uh, kill his prey. So he's often going to do one or two big bites on them, and then they kind of die in a longer period of time or pass away over a longer period of time. Um, but he's got a really hearty stomach. So he's also kind of known... His affectionate nickname is the garbage disposal of the animal world. Um, and so he's able to pretty much eat anything and not be harmed, even if it's gone bad. But an animal like a, a snake that we met who was yawning earlier, um, it can go bad in their stomach, even just like after a day or so. So they really want to be able to digest it um, and get through um, their system. They actually have like a shorter intestinal system than humans do, not just because they're smaller than us. Um, we have a longer one because we also are absorbing plant material as well. And that takes longer to digest in your stomach. Animals who are only eating plants have very long intestines. And animals who are just eating meat have very short intestines. Interesting. We've gotten into the, the digestion part of the broadcast. Yeah. Everybody I'm also going to move us here to another animal. Not that Keelat's not really cool, um, mm -hmm. but he's not doing a whole lot. And that's pretty much most ectothermic or cold-blooded animals don't move a lot. And that's mm -hmm. because why would you run around and get all hot to just force yourself to cool down later on? So if they're at the right temperature, they tend to just hang out and chill. So I'm going to rotate here between a couple of our fish tanks as we take our next few questions. Fantastic. Well, we're going to go back to Miss Burke's class. They think they got their mic working again, so we're going to check in with them and see. And if not, I have their question in the chat. Three, two, oh, three. My question. Go ahead. How fat can a reptile's body get? How oh, fat how... can a reptile's body get? Nice. That's a wonderful question. So depends on the reptile, which I know is not the best answer. Um, but it depends on where they live in the world full time um, and the type of reptile that they actually are overall. But to give you a comparison, humans, we're about 37 degrees Celsius all the time. Most animals try and stay within a 10 degree range to that, to our body. And that's kind of their pinpoint that they stay on. But of an animal who lives in a climate that gets really cold all the time, um, they might be able to survive at a lower temperature versus an animal who lives in a climate that's hot all the time. Their base level is going to be warmer. One thing that's kind of neat, too, that you can look at if you look at animals in various parts of the world is how their bodies are shaped. So you'll notice in the Arctic or Antarctic environments, a lot of animals are more spherical. They're fat. They keep all that heat in, whereas animals in the tropics tend to be thinner and skinnier so they can radiate that heat outward. So the way our bodies are formed is a direct relation to where we live on this planet. Which is really exactly. Cool. You're exactly on the right track there, Jesse, as well. I'll add to that. Yeah. Take a look at animals' ears, tails, and fingers when you're looking at them. So animals who tend to live in a colder climate or can get cold have small appendages. So their ears are close to their body. Their tails are short and stubby. Think of like a polar bear or a grizzly bear versus an animal like an elephant. Elephant ears are massive and they can actually help cool the elephant off. And a polar bear's ears are quite tiny because what they're trying to do is keep those important parts of their body close to the center. Like Jesse was saying, they're very big, round, and they stay warm. So they want all of their important bits of their body to be close in so that they stay nice and toasty warm. Nice. And by the way, you've gotten some very excited kid fans in the background as you're showing these seahorses, so way to go. Uh, <laughs> let's head to Mr. Falkner's class. Let's see if the mic works now. Um, why are the turtles' noses uh, like bigger than normal turtles? Oh, very oh. good question. Yeah, so you might have noticed when we met our turtles earlier, um, they actually had a similar nose that kind of looks like our seahorses do now. And they have them for different reasons, though. But our turtles have them like that um, because they're actually still breathing air the way you and I do. They can just hold their breath for an incredibly long time. So they are a reptile and they use lungs and their noses to breathe air around them. So they have to come up to the surface every once in a while and take a big breath in. But they're also a prey animal. 
So that means they can be eaten by other things. And if you're a big old turtle and you go up to the surface to take a breath, something might see you and go, I want you for dinner tonight. So to help that, they use their really kind of tiny little nose, just like these guys have here in front of us, and they just stick the top of their nose up above the water. That way they're not seen and they can stay safe and sound um, when they are in the water swimming. Great question, guys. All right, we're gonna to head to our Oshawa classes in just a second, but I love this question from our Facebook friends. So Janet wants to know, do monotremes switch between ecto and endothermic? And Mary Ellen, you can explain what a monotreme is. Oh, that's yeah. amazing. I love that. So a monotreme is a really cool type of mammal. And Annie is actually also a monotreme. Um, I'll give her some more credit here, even though we've yet to see her. Maybe someday she'll hear that I talk about her so much. She'll come out and say hi to me. Um, Annie, who we saw earlier, and platypuses as well, or platypi. Um, are monotremes, and they are mammals who lay eggs. So a way that we can classify different animals is the type of birth that they have. And there's three main types. There's a live birth, like humans. So our babies are born and they're just out and about in the world. There's an egg birth, like many reptiles or birds. They have to come out of an egg. And then there's a egg-live hybrid that some snakes do, where the baby starts off in an egg, hatches inside the mom, and then is a live birth after that. Um, animals, I believe garter snakes do that as well. So a monotreme is a mammal who lays eggs, which is very rare. There's only two types that do that. And that's a great question if they start off ectothermic and go endothermic later on in life. I can't say I've researched that. So Jesse, if you're able to Google it for us real quick, if you have the answer, I'll, I'll try and find that before our next question, but that is a good one. To my knowledge, yeah. they're warm-blooded throughout their entire lives, but I could be wrong about that, so we'll stay tuned. Uh, for now, let's head to our Oshawa class. Miss Wheatley's first, and then Miss Charuri, we're coming to you next. Miss Wheatley's class. Hi, guys. Say hi. 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 <laughs> okay, go ahead, Sylvia. How old is the Komodo dragon? Yes. Ooh, how old is our Komodo dragon? Hmm, okay, let me think about that for a second. Keelat was actually born here at the Toronto Zoo as well, which is really cool. And he was actually part of the first clutch or hatchlings um, of his species here, which is also pretty neat as well. Um, let me think for a second. I'll also say, while I'm thinking on that date, uh, whoever did ask the question about the monotremes, it's not very rare that I'm stumped by a question. So I want to congratulate you on that for something that I don't know. And I'm very interested to learn now and, uh, and find out more. So I love that opportunity as well. <laughs> so Keelat was born in 2004, I believe. So that makes him, we'll do some quick maths here. I believe that makes him around uh, 16 or 18 years old. I might've done that math incorrectly. <laughs> I, I'm, it's always astonishing that people, people or Komodo dragons born in 2004 would be 18 now. It's kind of terrifying all at once. <laughs> uh, but by the way, on the debate about ectotherms, this is literally like a scientific debate. Like there's a oh. Berkeley thing talking about the fact that they're quite different than some other mammals. So the platypus and echidna are very weird. They're much, they're, they're the most diverse group of, or the most distinct group of mammals from every other mammal in the world. Even marsupials, even the things that have babies and pouches are closer to us than monotremes are. So uh, they've got a lot of weird things going on. Uh, platypus are poisonous too, which is one of the only poisonous mammals in the world. So some or venomous mammals in the world. So very, very neat things. Great question, guys. All right, uh, Mr. Murray's class, and we're gonna take a few from YouTube. But for classes that have more questions, you will be able to share them with us after the fact. We're gonna make up a Padlet for you and share that link with you after the broadcast is done. But Mr. Murray's class, come on in uh, and go for it. Can you hear us? Yeah, we're great. All right, uh, Nathra here has a question, but she wants me to ask it for her. On the back uh, top of this seahorse, there was a part of their body that was moving. We wondered what that was called. Oh yeah, of course. So let me head back over to our seahorses over here and we can take a quick look at one up close. So let's take a look here at the little part. So the little bit on their back that's moving, that's actually one of their fins to help them move around. So seahorses are not great swimmers, but they can swim well enough to get them around their habitat. So that back fin that they have 
Um, it moves around like that and that gives them a little bit of momentum or push. It would just be like us kind of kicking our feet in the water. That's what that fin does for them. They are shockingly fast when they want to be, when they want to strike, so to speak, so if they're hunting food. Um, I don't think you got the chance to see that today because they're not doing food in the tank, but seahorses are remarkably quick when they want to be, but that keeps them very, it's a low energy usage to move through the water, much less so than moving big fins or anything like that. Great question, guys. All right, we are at the 40 minute mark, so I want to make sure we've got some time for just a few more questions from some of our classes. A uh, Second Street Junior Middle School, if you want to come in, and we'll wrap up with Ms. Benoit after that, and I'll make sure everybody else has a padlet to share questions on a virtual whiteboard when this broadcast is done. So Mr. Folker's group, come on in and take us away. Okay, five, six, minutes. We had a student who asked, does, uh, how long the Komodo dragons live for? Yeah, how oh, long okay. do they live currently? How long do they live? Oh, great question. Yeah, so there is some difference for some species of animals on living um, in captivity versus in the wild. So some species can do better in captivity. Some can do better in the wild. Um, at places like the Toronto Zoo, we do have a full team of vets here um, and nutritionists and keepers who are kind of watching them all the time. So we are able uh, to help them um, potentially live longer here with those resources. But on average, you're going to see a Komodo dragon live between 30 and 50 years, which is pretty cool and quite a long lifespan for them. So yeah. Kilat is well, he's, I'd say he's like a young adult right now, if we are comparing him to humans. Having his moody teen years, our Komodo dragon friend. <laughs> um, let's head to one last question live, and then I do want to note and bring up on the broadcast, everyone. So we are going to have a Padlet which is a virtual whiteboard. So if you guys have questions, if you're on Facebook, YouTube, our live classes, you want to ask more about thermoregulation, some of our reptile or cool animal friends today, maybe these jellyfish that Mary Ellen is beautifully ending with, uh, you can share all those questions on that Padlet link below. But let's wrap up with Ms. Benoit's class. Welcome in in Cordes to, uh, to end off our broadcast. Take us away, guys. <laughs> oh, Ms. Benoit, can you repeat that? Uh, chef. Does poisonous spit the Komodo Oh, dragon? I like it. This is a good one. So this was a question that was debated for a very long time in the scientific community, much like the monotremes and our marsupial friends uh, who we also met today. So they're not poisonous, but they are venomous. So they do have a venom. They also have a lot of bacteria in their saliva or in their spit in their mouth. Um, that can cause a lot of damage. So they are a venomous animal, um, and they also do have a lot of bacteria. So they're kind of a double threat, if, if you think about it like that. That's so funny. It's been a while since I've heard this question scientifically, and I like that the conclusion was not one or the other, but both. Uh, yeah. That's what they came to. Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a lizard that can get to be 10 feet long. It's the apex predator where it lives, and it's got a venomous and deeply infectious bite. So right. it's not something you particularly want to tangle with, but... <laughs> One of the most extraordinary animals on this planet. Guys, exactly. Either way, I don't want to be uh, be with them. <laughs> want to be on the boardwalk above them as you, you see them. Yeah. Uh, Mary Ellen, this has been so much fun. Time flies as you're having fun. So we are nearing the end of the broadcast. Before we bring in our class to say a big thank you and goodbye, is there any final message you want to share with all our teachers today? I do, in fact. So if you really enjoyed uh, meeting our animals today and wanted to learn a little bit more about them, I encourage everybody to go check out the Toronto Zoo and the Exploring by the Sea Deer Pants YouTube pages. We have done so many videos, I think about 40 or so over the last two years, where we go about the zoo and learn all about our creatures that we love so much. Um, so I encourage you to go watch any of those, tune into our future ones that we do, as well as something very exciting. I know Keylat wasn't doing a whole lot today for us, but he is an incredible mover and a very cool species to watch. And we have a partnership with something called Zoo Life. Um, and what you can do is if you go to the Toronto Zoo website, we actually have a live webcam on Keylat as well as our new baby giraffe right now as well. It's live today until four o'clock. And sometimes when you're watching those cameras, you can actually see and meet a, a volunteer from the Toronto Zoo and they'll talk to you about those animals as well. So head over there, you can watch his live cam and check out what he does throughout the day. Maybe he'll be swimming, maybe he'll be eating, um, or maybe he'll be basking. 
So I encourage everyone to go see that. It just went live today, which is really exciting. Mm -hmm. Very, very exciting. Well, I brought up the Toronto Zoo site for anyone who wants to check that out. So many other resources highlighting all their amazing conservation work as well. And Zoo Life really is an incredible program. We've had the chance to talk with them before as well. So check that out for links on the Komodo dragon, all the other amazing animals that they feature. Mary Ellen, this has been so much fun. As you know, we end every broadcast. I'm gonna bring in our teacher friends to say a big thank you before we wrap up for the day. Again, if you have more questions, Check out that Padlet link, everybody. But for now, Miss Wheatley's class, Mr. Okay. Rich class, Miss Ben Wall, Mr. Fogg. <laughs> <laughs>